So this is Clarence Moy with the Words Daily here with the sound team from Netflix's The Guilty, which is currently streaming. Team, since there's three of you, I'm going to let you go around the Zoom and uh, introduce yourself. So uh, Mandel, why don't we start with you? Mandel Winter, supervising sound editor. David? Uh, David Esparza, also sound supervisor and also re-recording mixer. And last but not least, Ed. Uh, Ed Novick, production sound mixer. Excellent. Good to meet you guys. Same here. Nice, nice to meet you. So I, David, before you came, uh, Mandel and Ed and I were chatting about how they had worked together for a long time. I'm assuming you guys are all just a, a cluster of sound engineers who are just all uh, tied in together and have a shorthand and, and can fly through things like this. Yeah, we've we've been working together for a number of years. Excellent. Uh, so I know that you... Assume, uh, sorry, Clarence, but never assume that we fly through anything. <laughs> <laughs> that there are roadblocks all over the place. Good call. But not. Good but call. We, you know, having having access to to post for me means that I we can get through these roadblocks hopefully a little better. So I know that you've all worked with uh, Antoine Fuqua, the director, before. Um, tell me about your collaboration with him, and I'll just pose that to anybody who wants to answer it. Well, sound is very important to Antoine, and so he takes it very seriously. He wants our input. And, uh, and he thinks sonically, so he has great ideas on where he wants the track to go. Yeah, Antoine, what does that mean, thinks sonically? Sorry, I, 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 I'm sorry so to interrupt you, David. I just have ideas about what it's gonna sound like as well as what it's gonna look mm -hmm. like. So okay. he's, he's not just looking at the camera and figuring out just the shot. He's like, this scene is gonna sound like this as well. Okay. Yeah. David, you were uh, yeah, going to say something. And, yeah, Antoine really, he really loves a very rich, full track. Um, uh, lots of uh, uh, density uh, uh, and clarity in the track to help tell the story. Um, and so, you, you know, his, his films always pose an interesting challenge uh, sonically in, in a number of ways, you know, whether it's, you know, the, um, uh, the detail of the crowds in Southpaw, or you know the the um, uh, the uh, the ambiences in a in the world of Magnificent Seven or the storm event in the Equalizer Two. All you know, all these films have these very large uh, events uh, locations that um, require a lot of detail in the sound to to tell the story. And that's very typical of Antoine's films. Mm -hmm. From, from my point of view, working with Antoine is, is wonderful because he does want me to succeed. He wants production sound to succeed. He wants the live sound captured on the day we're filming. Um, there are people, other filmmakers perhaps, who are willing to get, get what we can get, stay out of the way, we'll fix it later. That's not really his approach. If I can get it, he wants me to succeed. If I'm not succeeding, he wants to know why and what can he do to help. Um, so having that kind of support is, is, is really great. It really helps me uh, succeed. So he approaches all of you with this idea of doing the guilty during the pandemic with all the restrictions and the rules that come along with that um, and in a short time frame. What does that mean to you guys in terms of sound? Does that give you anxiety? Does that, you know, is it just another, another day in the, another day of the office? Um, well, let, me, let me start that way we can go sort of sequentially. Yeah. Is Davey okay with that? Sure. Yeah. Um, obviously, production comes first and with or pre production. And with that came the planning on how to do this movie in a very unique way. Um, while it appears that there's only one actor uh, and, the, and uh, the other actors should be uh, nearby, that wasn't the case. The other actors were at home, and home meant wherever they live, that's where they're going to do their performance. Um, so my challenge was not only to, not only to, to capture Jake's performance uh, live, uh, make it sound good, make it make it believable, make it belong in the space that he's uh, existing in, but also to capture the other actors live during their phone calls. So there's a uh, there's the interaction part where uh, the communication has to happen, um, and there's the the pro audio aspect of it, which is trying to get actors to perform pro audio functions in their home without a sound recordist. Um, so the planning of this was was intricate. Uh, it required putting together a recording kit, um, 
providing YouTube videos, instructions, um, and making it in such a way that they could they can use it easily and succeed. Um, I can't say we had 100% success, but we, we had a good a, a good number. Um, and for considering there's no re rehearsal for this kind of thing, I think we did pretty well. Um, the actors were coached before they would the, before they came on to the uh, uh, the conference call um, by my utility person, who's also my son, Richard. Um, who has infinite patience and was able to guide them through the nuts and bolts of their um, audio recording, uh, their, their proximity, their time code, their folders, um, all, of the, all of the nuts and bolts, so that when they came into the conference call, they were pro ready. Um, and that part, I think, you know, went as well as we could hope. Beyond that, other sounds that required Jake to continue. Um, with a scene would, would also come for me. They might be uh, audio cues, vocal cues, sound effects, uh, answering machines, things like things of that nature. In, in one case, there's an actor who was unable to perform live, who pre-recorded. Um, that was part of a playback scheme as well. So that went uh, out of my laptop uh, and into the phone. The idea was to keep Jake going, make sure he can always hear what he has to hear uh, when he has to hear it. And you know, provide those cues for him. The takes were very, very long, um, 20 to 30 minutes, and that created its, its own uh, set of problems for a boom operator who has to hold a mic over his head. Um, the solution for that was to, was to use a, an exoskeleton system. Uh, it's made uh, initially for people who work above their heads in manufacturing. Um, but it was modified for our use, and we, uh, I think we're the first film to use it from start to finish. So I'm, I'm quite pleased with that. Wow. That's the nuts and bolts. Mandela, David, you want to add? Sure. Um, after production, we, we had not only all of the audio from on set with Jake, but we had 13 remote recording rigs that we also had to gather all the dailies from. And our, our picture editor and assistant editor really combed through all of that and got it to all sync up. And, and then we got all the dailies and had to start putting it back together again. And mm -hmm. it worked really well, um, but it's a lot of material to go through to, to find everything. Sure. Yeah, I then, think, um, you know, early on when we read the script, you know, I had shared you know, some concerns about, uh, you know, the uh, uh, time frame and everything like that, because, you know, on the paper, the, the soundtrack seems pretty simple. We're in one location, talking on the phone, all very simple stuff, uh, you know, and they only shot for, you know, what was it, 10, 11, 12 days, something like that. Um, and so, you know, seeing as how, you know, sound is always just a fraction of the production, they're going to be like, well, it was only, a you know, this long of a production, that means sound, you know, we only need it to be this long. So uh, obviously, you know, there's more to the story uh, than that um, because in the script, you know, we read about all these actions that were occurring um, on the other side of the phone. Um, you know, we knew going into it that none of these actions were actually gonna be recorded. We get the voice recordings from the actors, uh, you know, in the remote locations, but that's it. Um, and the amount of detail that was in the story that was happening on the other side of the phone, uh, not mm -hmm. just words, but all the movement, actions, uh, riding in vehicles, all those sort of things, it was all going to have to be completely uh, created from scratch, completely. Uh, normally, when you would uh, get uh, audio, production audio from the set, it would be laden with um, environment and uh, movement and, uh, and uh, the characters manipulating objects. And a lot of times that stuff, when it's recorded well, we love using it. Um, and, uh, and, and most of the time it does get used if it's recorded properly. Um, obviously Ed is primarily concerned with making sure the voice is captured properly, but you know, he does a good job of also getting the, the, the movement and stuff whenever that's what's, what's happening on the screen and, and the production allows you know, for that sound to, to live in a clean environment. Um, <clears throat> um, so without this production track, all the movement, everything had to be completely 
invented from scratch. Uh, and that goes down to even the most subtlest movements on the track, which include, you know, the jostling of the phone, moving it from one hand mm -hmm. to the other, just the, even those sort of uh, fairly uh, mundane effects, all, you know, the movements, the character shifting from uh, in their seat, getting up, walking across the room, all that stuff is just completely uh, created from uh, Foley sound effects and recordings, that kind of stuff. And then I assume it, you know, it, the sounds are created. And then I assume that it has to be put through some kind of filter to make it sound like it's coming from a cell phone or from, you know, a, yeah. or a, uh, another headset right, or something correct. like that. Uh, yeah. Uh, I've, traditionally in cinema, the, the band, the, uh, the, something through the phone is represented in a very limited bandwidth, like you'd hear on a phone. Um, uh, and, um, and it would usually also be played just up the center of the screen and not very much environment would be heard. Uh, that's the reality on the phone. Um, initially, we started uh, out by experimenting recording actual movements through a phone, recorded, performed through a phone, recorded to another phone uh, uh, in a process Walter Murch termed uh, worldizing. Uh, we attempted this at first uh, and we found that, you know, it, it yielded the, the sort of sound that you're familiar with through the phone, but it left very little detail as to what was actually happening. It's just a sort of scratchy movement is all we kind of got out of it. And very quickly, we found out this wasn't going to provide the sort of detail that was needed to tell this story. Uh, and so, you know, through a process of uh, uh, doing multiple passes through the film, we slowly uh, uh, widened our acceptable bandwidth in in places and it was something that we found ourselves modulating throughout the course of the film depending on uh what the story called for but we w didn't shy away from allowing ourselves to use much more bandwidth and also uh moving that uh center speaker you know uh um widening that out a bit and creating more sound stage to allow the environments to breathe and live because if we put everything just straight up the pipe again just write up all sounds through one speaker it just didn't provide the uh, the headroom that we would need to uh tell the story in the manner that was needed so, uh, we needed more room for the dialogue to live in the center and the environments to live around uh and so manipulating the bandwidth and the sound stage and and uh, and just applying all that detail to a scene, almost like a radio play, is sort of how mm -hmm. we approached it at a time. And uh, and just experimentation to find what we could get away with. I mean, we went as far as to try and go completely full bandwidth with certain things. And we found we ran into, well, that doesn't sound like it's through the phone anymore. Is that something happening in the office now? You know, so we had, it was a experimentation that we had to go through till we, found the right uh, uh, formula to apply to each phone call. Because like I said, uh, it modulated depending on uh, the scene, uh, the moment in the film, the, what the characters are saying, the amount of intimacy that we wanted to create. Because it wasn't just with the sound effects we did this with. Uh, Steve Pedersen, our dialogue music mixer, also modulated that bandwidth and harmonic distortion uh, with the voice as well. Um, so that some calls started out very futzed but through the film, we would open it up to allow the uh, uh, audience to sort of lean in and become more intimate with the, uh, the characters. Um, so Ed, you were talking about uh, working with the, and your son working with the actors and getting them trained on, on, on how to operate their own sound equipment and before they got on that conference call. So they were, when they were performing uh, with Jake, I, I've as I've done some research, I saw boxes and boxes of of care packages. Let's just call them sound care packages that went home to each of the actors uh, to prepare them for this. What what was in those boxes? We try. I tried to keep it as both as basic and as complete at the same time as I could. Uh, a desk stand, a clamp, a mic, a cable, um, and a USB interface that uh, that doubled as a recorder. Um, so that they could, we could get their audio going through the computer, um, and we could assess what how how we were doing with it, and they could also use it as communication. We had we had tried doing a Zoom um, effort, 
since everybody's using Zoom during the pandemic and people, even you know, non-audio people are basically familiar with Zoom can do this. So it became rather difficult and it surprises that the day one, it, uh, it, it got real buggy. Too many users, not enough bandwidth. Um, you know, we have only what's available on the stage that we're in. And so we pivoted to a conference call uh, where everybody was on a conference call in mute until it was their time to unmute, uh, which is how I managed to get both sides of the, of the, of the phone call fed out to the headphones where people could hear. I, would just, I had a phone in the conference call. Um, I would go into mute and just take, the, take that audio out. Um, I had a second phone in the conference call for putting audio in, uh, dialogue cues, sound effects, uh, that sort of thing. Nadal, have you ever worked on anything of this scale before? I mean, it just hearing you describe it, you know, looking at the film, you get a sense that it is challenging to be able to recreate all these different levels of sound. But just, just hearing you describe it, I mean, it just seems like a, a massive undertaking that has to be done in a very short period of time. Have you ever accomplished anything like this before? Is this, you know, it just seems like it's sort of unique of its kind. Well, this was a unique experience. Absolutely. Um, I think every project presents challenges that you need to figure out and rise to the occasion. So this was just another one set of challenges that we, we needed to figure out. So what was the biggest challenge to solve? I mean, we talked about the exoskeletons, we've got the, the packages going home to the actors, you know, you've got to, to blend in the um, atmospheric sound in, 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 in association with the dialogue. What was the biggest challenge? I think the, the biggest challenge was trying to just make sure that we were telling a compelling story through the other side of the phone um, because there, we could see what we needed to do on screen, but working with Antoine and Jason and figuring out what our filmmakers wanted it to sound like on the other side of the phone really helped guide us. Even with ADR and group where we were bringing the call center to life, but also changing some lines on the other side of the calls and, and figuring things out that way. So it was challenging, but it was uh, just as rewarding as, as any other project. I mean, it's fantastic. Right. Well, I think those are all the questions I have for all three of you. Thank you so much for the time. This has been incredibly enlightening and uh, a lot of fun to hear about all of the uh, events that went behind the scenes to making this film. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Clarence.